tonight we're going to talk about the second G in um, just save. There's no G's in save, but there's four G's in communicating salvation. So uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Kelly, by the way. I'm glad you're here. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And I'm the pastor here at RPYA. And um, I just love our team, and everything that we do here is literally run by students. It's run by you, because this is not my ministry. This is your ministry. And the best part about it is that I get to partner with young adults who are passionate Christ followers who are here to reach the world, and I'm stoked to be a part of that. So thank you for letting me be a part of that. Anyways, that's not a part of the sermon, but yeah, you just got me amped. Thank you, Joey James, for doing announcements, and Logan on the, on the, on the vocals. Uh, so, uh, a lot of great things. Uh, Jordan is like doing a great job with our worship team, so thank you so much. And thank you for our media team for gre- bringing us amazing products like that. Um, anyways, you know that I, w- I was selling my Jeep, right? And, and it's officially sold. <laughs> I, was, I say that, it's so sad. It's really sad. I spent a lot of money on that thing. And... Um, uh, what it is, if you don't know, it was a um, 2013 Jeep Wrangler Sport, but I made it more like a beast. And, uh, you know, camouflage, everything. Um, and during this transaction period, because, you know, you, 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 you try to sell things on Craigslist, Auto Trader, whatever, I actually sold it through Facebook, but instead of using the diameter of the city that I lived in, I targeted a demographic uh, that had maybe a little bit more money than me. So I... Uh, <laughs> I advertised that the Jeep was in Newport Beach and, <laughs> and you know, Dana Point and Laguna because uh, I want to get that Laguna money. Man, get that Orange County money. Um, so I'm advertising and I get a text. Uh, is the Jeep still available? And I'm like, yes, it is. Uh, do you want to schedule like a phone consultation? You want to talk? Um, because I just want to make sure you're not a robot uh, because you get a lot of those. And she's like, the lady on the phone, she's like, oh, I'd rather text than talk. And I'm like, oh, this is probably a robot. Uh, next thing you know, she's like in Africa, and she's wanting me to send her my, you know, social security number. And so you've never gotten any of those before? <laughs> um, some of you are bowing your head like, man, that happened to me. <laughs> so I didn't send her my social security number, uh, but I did text her. I'm like, all right, that's fine. That's weird. Let's find a time to meet in, in Huntington Beach. And she was down to meet in Huntington Beach. I'm like, great. So I go down to Huntington Beach, and she's, I'm still texting with her. And I'm like, why won't she talk on the phone? And then I realized, like, there's this thing called telephobia, where you're afraid to talk on the phone because you don't know what the person is going to say or, or, you know, you want to be able to control the conversation. And so you avoid talking on the phone so that you have more time to think about your responses. Anyways, Google it. It's a thing. And I uh, finally get to Huntington Beach. We meet at Sancho's Taco. I used to live in HB. And if you've you've never eaten at Sancho's Taco, you've never had a taco. And so we stop at my favorite place, Sancho Taco. And so I get out of my Jeep, and I see this girl and guy walking towards me. And it's the girl. I'm like, awesome. And she walks up to me. She's like, sorry, I can't talk very well. I'm like, clearly. And... uh, In my head, I think. I, didn't, I don't think I said that. Sometimes things come out, and I'm like, yeah. Um, maybe I did say that. I don't know. Uh, but I probably said it in a really endearing Kelly McCoy way. Uh, clearly. <laughs> so, so she's like, I'm sorry, I can't talk to her. Uh, you know, I was involved in an accident. I'm like, oh, tell me about this accident. This sounds awesome. Uh, not awesome, actually. She's like, yeah, I've had six reconstructive surgeries and my jaw is wired shut. I'm like, what happened? Well, she's like, oh, I was at this concert with my husband in Vegas, October 1st. And then I got a bullet caught in my mouth and it shattered my jaw into multiple fragments. And I had, um, I had uh, bullet, bullet shrapnel in my face. And then she takes her phone out and she shows me a 3D images of her MRI and it's literally her jaws like shattered to bits. So I was like, I am talking to a real live miracle here. And so we go through the uh, negotiating process, which wasn't hard because my heart was already broken. And so, uh, so we, I sold her the Jeep, but I'm like, before you leave, can you and your husband set, stand in front of the Jeep and can I take this last picture of my Jeep with you as an inspiration uh, for, my, for my young adult ministry someday. So I actually have a picture of, who, of, her, of her and her husband. 
And uh, so she's a survivor, and I applaud her. And um, you can see on the left side of her cheek, that's where the bullet went. And she uh, has, like, some scarring, and she wants to keep her sunglasses on, which I understand. And then, but what you don't know, she is so familiar with pain. Like, this is not the first time something bad has happened to her. She told me that when they, they got married like 10 years ago, but within their first three years of marriage, she contracted um, breast cancer. And, and oh, we're good with there. Rest in peace. Um, Jeep. Um, the Jeep. <laughs> uh, she's still alive, praise God, uh, which is amazing. One of the things that reminds me because I, I, that experience happened. But remember what we talked about last week? God made you good. He is pleased with you. He loves you. And he desires a relationship with you. You remember we talked about that? In case you didn't, in case you didn't see it last week, and uh, I invite you to go ahead and check that out. But the reality is that God does love you. But you can't see situations like that or hear about situations like that without asking the question that everybody's dying to know the answer to, is that if God loves us so much, then why is there so much evil that is happening? Why there's so much suffering? Why does a bullet, a bullet have to uh, injure and kill? Like, literally, this incident in Vegas killed over 83 people. Sorry, 58 people, and then it injured over 851 people, and that's within 10 minutes of a guy shooting off rounds. And then later on, an hour after this happened, he was found dead in his hotel. So if God loves us so much, why is there so much evil? And that's the question that we are seeking to answer. When we're talking about salvation, you have to, show, you have to let people know the answer to this question. And if you don't know the answer to this question, well, you're, you're, you're here. Praise God. Awesome. But the truth is really, I don't know, it's not, it's not comforting. The truth behind this answer is not, it's not going to make you feel good. It's like going to a doctor and today's the day where you don't get good news. Next week, you'll, you'll get a lot of good news. But this week, in order to share the good news about the gospel, you have to tell them the bad news. So today's the day where you give people sobering information about who they are. And the truth is, is that we're all guilty. And we need grace, which is the second G. We need grace. So why is there so much evil? The first thing I want to tell you, the reason why there's so much evil is because we choose to do it. We choose it. And in fact, we chose to do it. And it's genetic. And it's in our DNA. And it's passed down spiritually as well. See, it started with the first human beings on earth, Adam and Eve. You guys know who those guys are or, or that guy and that girl is? See, look at Genesis 2 real quick with me. We're going to turn to Genesis 2. And as we turn to Genesis 2, again, this is written by uh, the, the, the leader, one of the leaders of Israel. His name is Moses, right? He freed the Israelites out of bondage. And on the backside of the desert, he puts pen to papyrus and he writes this down. Now, we aren't in Genesis 2. Last week we were in Genesis 1, and Genesis 1 is a big picture. Big picture, it's a poem, it's a song of creation, and we're inviting you to sing along with that song of creation. But in Genesis 2, we get a closer vision of what God intended with his creation. And it says here, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will certainly die. Die. See, in order for God to show his great love to you, he needed to give you a choice to not love him back. It's not love if I force you to love me. It's not love. So in addition to creation, God gave you free will. And this is how he did it, by giving you one option to not choose him. And this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is a great option because there's a huge planet before them. And then there's a second tree called the tree of life. I don't know why they didn't eat that one, but whatever. 
So Genesis chapter 3 continues. It says this. This is how it all went down in the garden. The first sin that separated humanity. And if this was like, a, like an elementary school, I would do it like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animals that God made. And he said to the woman, <clears throat> did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? I don't, that's, what I would, that's how I would do that. But I'm sure you guys would do that much better than I would. All you monarch Christian fellowship kids. <laughs> the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the tree in the garden. We, we may eat from, from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not even touch it or die. Good job, Eve. Way to kill it. Boom. Hamp up, right? So, so the first thing Satan does is try to cast doubt. But I love how Eve responds with some truth. That's really, really good, right? But what happens when doubt doesn't work? Pfft. Let's see what's next. Satan's going to straight up lie. You will not certainly die, says Satan, or the serpent to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. That is also true. Now, the interesting thing that Satan does when he first tries to cast out, the second thing he does is just feeds you a lie. This <laughs> is straight up. You won't die. No, that's absolutely true. You're going to die. That's exactly what God said. But what made his lie so palatable is that he wrapped it in truth. He wrapped it in truth. Kind of like when I try to feed uh, my dog medicine, I just wrap it in peanut butter. Just boom. He doesn't even know. I just gave him some poison. All right. <laughs> poison that will heal him. Okay, relax. Now, the next thing that, what does Eve do? She hasn't sinned yet, so relax. When the woman saw that the fruit from the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, okay, she was lingering. She was being a girl, right? She was shiny, and she's a foodie. Eve's a foodie. I get it. And it was also desirable for gaining wisdom. After all, now she's starting to justify, like, oh, I'm going to become wise. This is good for, like, there's nothing wrong with this. It's good for wisdom. Now that desire takes plant in her heart, and this is what happens next. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. Wait a minute. Her husband was with her the whole time, saw the whole thing go down, and he didn't, he didn't do anything? Like, man, I know. Like, What the heck, man? You need to rise up. You need to be a leader. You need to say something, man. Just, ah, gosh, I know God wants to say something to the men here about leading, and I hope you do not act like Adam ever. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed some fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, this is what happens when sin takes place in our life. The first thing that happens is shame. Shame. See, the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. They, you know why they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden? Because they were familiar with walking with God in previous days. They, they were familiar with that. But instead of running to God, they ran away from God. See, they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, what? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Somebody say, where are you? Remind me to get back to that. Fear is the next thing that took place in the heart of man. See, there's more than, see, you see, the fear, shame, and blame, they're all elements of death. See, your confidence died, Adam, the moment you sinned. Your ability to love God just died Right? You stopped seeing God for who he was, and that died. You instantly became insecure. Bam, that's death. He answered, this is what the, the man said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told, 
Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, pause. This is oddly similar to getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar, right? Or, you know, no, maybe you didn't get caught with your hand in the cookie jar, but you got, your, <laughs> you got caught with crumbs all over your face, right? This is the, the moment that mom walks into the room and says, were you eating cookies? God knows he was eating cookies. God knows it. But why does God ask these questions? Because he's concerned about a relationship. See, see, it wasn't that God left him. It wasn't that God condemned him. He was the one who ran away from God. He was the one who had shame. But instead of running to God, he ran away from God. And God showed up and said, where are you? Where are you? Let me tell you, people. If you're feeling distant from God today, it's not because he left. He's standing at the edge of the garden looking and saying, where are you? You. And of course, the end of sin, this is a surefire way that if you're struggling with anything in life, you will, no matter what, repeat this if you do this, all right? If you don't want to grow as a, as a believer or Jesus follower, if you are dealing with a sin right now and you don't ever want to deal with it, do exactly what Adam did, okay? I'll tell you. Here it goes. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. He's simply saying, God, not my fault, her fault. In fact, not even her fault. If it wasn't for you putting her in here, we wouldn't be in this mess. So I'm, a, I'm just wiping my hands of this. So God, you take care of this and we're good, right? No. He's blaming. Unless you take complete ownership over your mess, you will not progress. So, the question still remains, why the heck would God put a tree in the garden? Like, he could have eliminated this mess that we're in right now, right? Has anybody ever asked you, raise your hand if, if you've ever thought to ask that question, right? Why the heck would God put, put a, a sinful tree in the garden? Just raise it, I just want to know, okay, cool, I'm asking questions that people are asking, great. Speaking of questions, I'll tell you the answer. Um, speaking of questions... We have a hotline. I want to remind you that at the end of the series, we're going to do a Q&R with a really smart guy and myself. Uh, and that number is 949-791-9377. Those questions are completely anonymous. So I want to invite you to text in your questions because I know I can't, I can't address everything in a sermon, but we're going to have one sermon where we try to address everything. Unpause. Why would God put a tree in the garden? It's because he wanted a love relationship with you. He wanted a love relationship with you. But in order to do that, he needed to give you the ability to not choose him. For instance, my wife, my beautiful, lovely wife. If I were to lock her, if I were to eliminate any options of leaving, all right, let's just say it that way. Like, I'm, I, there's no nice way to put this, right? Right? Because that's essentially, if we're like, if we're praying, like, God, oh, man, I'm so mad that you let sin come in the world. That's like saying, God, I don't want you to ever give me free choice. It's like, God, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to have a relationship with you. I'd rather be a robot. That's like saying that. But God didn't want robots. He wanted a relationship. So anyway, so my wife, um, who's really crazy strong and smart and could totally kick people's butt. I've seen her do it on TV. If I, locked, if I eliminated the options for her to leave the, the house, um, that, and I, I made her love me physically, spiritually, emotionally, I just made her do that and eliminated any options otherwise. Would that be called love? No, that would be called something else, right? And the same thing is true with God, right? If God did not give you the opportunity to leave and he made you love him physically, spiritually, emotionally, that would not be called love. That would be called something else. And I think it's best illustrated in this one movie that I saw. It's called Bruce Almighty. And Bruce Almighty is, uh, well, it's a pretty funny movie, but it's a guy who's been given God powers, but he can't do one thing. He cannot force his ex to love him. Go ahead and check out the screen. Wait! Uh, 
do you feel now? Have you completely lost your mind? What, are you drunk? Yeah, I'm drunk. Drunk with power. Love me. Love me. Love me. Love me! I did. See, see, love requires choice. Love requires choice. And when we choose to leave God out of our lives, guess what? We, leave e- we let evil in. We let darkness in. When we choose to leave God out of our life, we let evil in. And the reason why evil exists in this world is because we chose to do it. And here's another thought. <clears throat> Have you ever thought, why are we affected by Adam and Eve? Like, they're the ones who messed up. I, I never would have done that. Like, I know better. You probably would. But nevertheless, have you ever thought, like, why would Adam and Eve still, like, why would their sin still affect me, like, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years later? Have you ever thought that? Well, let me tell you. The reason why Adam and Eve affect us today is because we are living under their federal headship. I know it's a big word. Federal headship is somewhat like a president, like we have President Trump, who oversees the United States of America, right? You know, and as funny as that is, Adam and Eve is the president of humanity, right? And so when President Trump, if he goes to war with another country, guess who's at war? All of us. All of us. And so what happened was God and, and humanity were at odds at that point. When Adam and Eve chose to kick God out of their hearts, we became, well, enemies of God. We showed up. We were born under Adam and Eve's headship. And they went to war with God, and we were innocent bystanders who were subject, you know, subsequently we were born on the wrong team. So that's why um, we are currently suffering for Adam and Eve. But God is so much, God is so gracious. See, that's the point of this, of this sermon, is to let you realize that, yeah, we're all guilty, and we need God's grace so bad. So the second reason why there's evil in this world is because the absence of God's presence in our heart only brings in darkness. Because the absence of light in our heart, see, that's what brings in the darkness. James 1, 16 through 17 says this. So go ahead and turn to the book of James. James is Jesus' brother. Man, I would hate to be Jesus' brother. That would suck. Like, Mary would always say to me, why can't you be more like Jesus? And, uh, and I'll be like, because I'm not Jesus, I'm James. And then my brother's like, well, I am, I'm actually God. Like, every older brother thinks they're God. Like, like, I would not even believe Jesus. And the reality was that James wasn't even one of the original disciples of Jesus. You know why? Because James didn't believe that his brother was God. Like, how? Like, that would suck. James going to his brother's bar mitzvah, he's like, yeah, I'm God. And like, like, probably not, but um, I'm just thinking, like, James could not, it took a lot of convincing for James to believe that Jesus was God. But when he turned around, he wrote a book, and it's the book of James. Hope you read it. It says this, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. I love that endearing camaraderie that James brings. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Hey, you're experiencing something good in your life? If it's really good, guess where it came from? It came from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. See, God is described as a Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. You know what? I was thinking, like, if God doesn't change like shifting shadows and he is like the Father of heavenly lights, that means there's no shadows in heaven. Because there's light everywhere. See, I have um, a disease, or I don't know if a disease, but I have, uh, I'm colorblind. 
That doesn't mean I uh, see things in black and white. I just don't see things the same way that you do. And that's because I have these receptor cones in my, in my eyes that receives light in different ways. We have red, blue, and green receptors. So I read the chemicals on your Dodger hat or Detroit hat, I'm sorry, um, uh, and, and it comes back blue and white in my, in my eyes, right? Now, I may have, but, but that hat's really not blue. It's made of chemicals that make the light, like make the receivers in most of our eyes look at it and say blue because colorblind people will see that and it looks more purple or even more red, right? But the chemicals in that thread or that cotton hits the light a certain way so that we, you know, interpret it as blue because everything is all about light. Now, the reality is, is that darkness is only measured by how much light is in the room. Chaos is only measured by how much order is in the room. Evil is only measured by how much goodness is in the room or in your heart. And the reason why evil exists is because humanity kicked God out of their hearts and let evil in. They let the darkness in. And so that's how light and dark work. And God, see, you know, James writes and tells us that God is light. And when we leave him out, there's only darkness left. And that's how I feel about heaven. The real, or, or heaven or hell. You know, hell sometimes feels like, man, that is messed up, like eternity of hell. But the reality is, is that if God is good and, and, and he's amazing and everything, we, we get the option to choose God for 80, 90 years or however long they, you, know, you end up breathing. But everything on earth, that's his oxygen that you're breathing. right? Every good and perfect gift comes from God, right? Everything that exists on this earth is come, comes from God and it's good. And you can recognize its goodness. It would be like living in your house and every day you rejected the fact that your parents existed and you just showed up and your refrigerator was full. Full of food of your favorite food. For me, I like guacamole and, and pepperonis. I just eat guac and pepperonis. And magically, like those were there every day. I could live off guac and pepperoni. Right? But I, at some point... If I continue to reject the presence of my parents or the people who own the house, eventually they have the right to say, no more. You don't want me, then you don't get my goodies. You don't get to live in comfort. You don't get to live in a climate-controlled house where every day you can go to bed on a comfy you know, mattress because you've rejected me. And hell is like that where God's presence is not. There's darkness, because if you don't want God now, then you're not going to want God for eternity. And I think it's actually very gracious, because if you are here on earth and you do not want to be led by God, and you don't want a relationship with him, then you are going to think heaven is hell, because there's nothing but God's presence all around you. Because he is light. And the evil that we experience on earth is the darkness that's within man because they rejected him as Lord. So the first reason why evil exists is because we choose to do it. Because without choice, there is no love. The second reason is because we've rejected goodness and what's left is evil. And the third reason why there's so much suffering <clears throat> is because we are contaminated. We are all contaminated, whether you have a lot or little. A lot or little. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned? All, all have sinned? You might be saying to yourself, I'm a good person. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good. Like, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't shot anyone lately. Um, good on you. The Bible, Paul writes in Romans, the book of Romans, he writes to Greek, a Greek culture. Very smart people. And Paul is a very smart guy. And he's saying, yes, 
all are contaminated. Like, like, like a cancer that is growing inside of you that you don't want anymore. I remember Jeff. Jeff, man, Jeff. He was a worship pastor at the first church that ever decided to hire me to be their youth pastor. I don't know what they were thinking. I was way too young. And uh, <clears throat> Jeff had two adopted beautiful kids. And I don't know what it's like to have a parent die. But I, don't, I can't even imagine what it's like to wake up every day wondering if your parent is going to be dead today. Because they lived with their, with their dad, Jeff, who had cancer. And he, he fought and fought and fought. And then I saw him waste away. And I remember going to his house. And he was like so skinny, emaciated. And all these drugs, they were just trying to make him comfortable. Because we knew that any day that this, this shell of a body was going to be gone. But Jeff was still talking, still singing praises. And I remember with all my heart. I remember with all my heart praying, God, heal Jeff. In the name of Jesus, get up. Like, just all, like, the Jesus juice, like, do this thing. Like, all the holy prayers, like, I've, ne I've never been, like, really, you know, like, ar an articulate prayer. So I was really coming up with some creative stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I felt like God didn't answer my prayer because the next day he died. And then I thought about it, and I'm like, well, no, God did answer my prayer. Because the only way that, God, that Jeff was going to live, and live healthy and free was if he was separated from his emaciated, cancer-infected body in heaven. So God cured him of his cancer. And now he's living in heaven, cancer-free. And he's got the party started for me. He's waiting for us. So, anyways, I just miss Jeff. Can't wait there to, to be there with him. But I do know that there's a cancer living in all of us. Just like AIDS, just like HIV, we all have sin in our body living in us. You don't have AIDS or HIV. I'm just saying, like, you've heard of those things. Some people were really relieved. <laughs> if you're wondering, you should get tested. Uh, don't take my word for it. But you know how cancer works, right? It's something small, then it grows and grows and grows. But no matter what, you don't want that in your body, right? All of us are infected. All of us are contaminated at some point with a sin sickness. And the only cure is to get a new heart transplant, amen? Right? That sin sickness has crept into your heart and made your heart dark. And the only cure is to get a suitable heart donor. But in order for that to happen, somebody's got to die. Jesus volunteers to give you a new heart. Far be it from us that we would still tolerate this sin. Far be it from us. But some of you aren't convinced. You think, man, my sin is just so small. You know, it's not worth eternity. Well, it is. Because by sinning against an eternal God, the only payment is an eternal payment. And your soul is eternal. You're destined to live forever. You just happen to be in a body. The only payment for your contaminated soul is an eternal payment. And you got two options. Either you pay for it or Jesus pays for it. Far be it from us that we would still allow ourselves to be contaminated. It's like this story of this kid named James. This kid named James. I'm going to pass out some brownies. Um, everyone's going to get a brownie. Um, I'm going to pass out this brownie. So there's a story about this kid named James. And he, you thought I was kidding. Um, he thought that he was going to go see a movie with his friends. And, and he was talking to his friends about this movie. And it wasn't Avengers. It was like... It was an interesting, interesting movie. Uh, but he, he knew it, it just had a little bit of contamination in this movie. Like, this movie was just a little bit seedy. 
This movie wasn't, like, there was just a little bit of bad stuff in this movie. And so he knew that um, before he can go see this movie, he needed to go ask permission from his, his mom. That, that, you know, like he needed to convince his mom that it would be okay for him to see this movie, even though this movie had a little bit of bad stuff in it. So the movie wasn't until Friday. It was Wednesday. So he goes to his mom and says, Mom, Mom, can I go see this movie on Friday with my friends? And she's like, what movie is it? And she's like, oh, well, tell me about it. Well, it has a little bit of bad stuff, Mom. Just a little bit. But the rest of it, it's, it's just a great movie. It's a great movie. Uh, and, the, and the mom looked at James, and James looked back at mom, and mom said this. Is it just a little bit? And he's like, yeah, mom, it's just a little bit. And the mom said, well, I'm going to leave it up to you. You make the best decision that you know how to make right now. I'm going to let you do that. I'm like, that's a good mom, right? Good mom? Good mom. Good mom. I like moms like that. So he calls his friends. He's like, oh, sweet. So he calls his friends. He's like, mom. Uh, not mom. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> he calls his friends. And he's like, hey, well, I can go see the movie on Friday. Buy me a ticket. Reserve it. We're good to go. Boom. He puts the phone down and goes right up to his room, starts playing Xbox. And while he's playing Xbox, his mom decides to make some brownies. So he mixes the milk. She mixes the sugar. She mixes the flour. She mixes the brownie mix. She puts the eggs in there somewhere. Um, and then she decides, I think, she decides that I'm going to add a special ingredient to, the, to my famous brownies. And she goes into the back. <laughs> She goes to the backyard, and the backyard's a place where their dog, Ginger, makes little tiny brownies, and <laughs> and she takes a teaspoon, puts it in the brownie mix, mixes it all up, and then, <laughs> you guys are not letting me get through this. <laughs> You guys are like waiting to see what's happening. James comes down. James comes down the stairs. He smells the brownies. He's like, oh, cool, great brownies. And then she, he grabs a brownie, puts it on a plate, and mom's like, hold on, let me get you some milk, and pours a glass of milk, sets it on, 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 on the table, gives him a fork, and right before he puts it to his mouth, mom says this. Hey, yeah, before you eat that, um, I put... Uh, a little bit of uh, Ginger's poop in that brownie mix. And instantly he drops the plate like, what are you doing? And it dongs on him. <laughs> Just a little bit of contamination contaminates the whole thing. And even though those brownies that you just ate are not contaminated... Your heart is. Your heart is. And we're all guilty. And we need grace. We need so much grace. James 4.17 says this. Anyone that knows the good they ought to do and not do it, sins. So just in case you don't know what a sin is, that's the definition of sin. Anyone who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. For the wages of sin is death. What kind of death? Spiritual and physical death. Man, I, I remember uh, there's this guy, he, he came up to, to my friend Mike Erie. He's gay. And he said, hey, hey Mike, like you're Christian, right? I, I, I identify myself as a gay person. Are you telling me that I'm going to hell? And, and I love Mike Erie's response because it's really important that we all get this. And this is what Mike Erie said. He said, there's no one, there's no one in heaven who deserves to be there. And the only way that we are going to get there is not going to be on our merit. It's not going to be on what we do, who we love, and what we say, and what's been done to us. It's going to be solely based on what Jesus did for me. 
Yes, the gospel is difficult to communicate. But it's so necessary. It's so necessary. Yes, we are guilty and we need grace. In order for people to understand the good news, they got to understand that we are guilty and we need grace. So why does evil exist? It's because we choose to do it. We've let the darkness in by shoving out the light of God. And because all of us at some point are contaminated, every single one of us. Now, this is what I want you to do tonight. I want you to take responsibility. We're not going to blame. See, if you feel distant from God today, I want to remind you, he's not the one that moved. God is standing at the garden saying, where did you go? Where are you? The reason why he asks is because he wants a relationship with you. So let's come to grips with the reality of our guilt and shame and stop blaming people. And let's just say, God, I'm sorry. I want to repent. The word repentance means you turn around, you turn away from the direction that you're going, and you turn to the highest standard of living. Of living. So you got to think of penthouse. Return, pent, high. Return and repent. The Bible says in John 1, 9, if there's ever a verse that you can anchor your forgiveness on, it's this one. If you've ever wondered whether or not you've been forgiven, you can anchor your forgiveness and your emotions on God's word, which is a lot better than your thoughts. John 1, 9 says this. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is like the Brita filter of life. He cleans your contamination. No problem. So what I want us all to become is just forgiven people. But tonight is a night where you've got to understand this second G. Is that we're guilty and we need grace, but God offers forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, I know that you have a plan for my life that is much greater than my own. I come to you and I ask you to take all the guilt and all the shame away, but I admit that I am a sinner and I need grace. And I am guilty and I need grace. I ask you to come into my life. Lead me, guide me from this day forward. And may your son be the only voice that I listen to And may his footsteps be the only steps that I follow. In Jesus' name we all said, amen.